Howdy. Howdy. We're at Texas A&M, and we have to continue that tradition. Uh, the talk, title of my talk is really about the imagination imperative. I do teach a large class, and that large class has to do with imagination as a starting point. It's about bridging global challenges and individual local responses. So I'm going to be talking about three things. Those three things today are the global challenge, the fact that global challenges can only be addressed by local responses, but every local response is done at an individual solution level. So the first one is basically, in our world, we face a tremendous amount of challenges. Those challenges can be cataloged as serious impacts, as complex challenges, as harsh realities. And if we were to just take a very quick snapshot on all kinds of impacts that we're causing on our world, it's about population, affluence, technology, and the factors that, according to the natural step, we're continuously violating the conditions of the Earth. We increase concentrations of substances we keep extracting. We keep putting back into the Earth things that we produce, some that do not degrade until many, many years. We keep on not allowing the Earth to heal on its own because we're physically displacing, over-harvesting, and ecosystem manipulation. And the worst part is that we're also taking away the ability of people to actually control their future, to determine their needs on their own. So when you look at these conditions, it's a kind of a bleak picture. And then you add to this the complex goals that many organizations want to do from the Millennium Development Goals, from poverty to AIDS to sustainability to gender equality. When you look at another level, the global challenges for humanity range from sustainable development through democracy, through energy, rich, poor gap, health. These are complicated issues. I never try to dumb things down, but there's always hope, and that's part of the talk. The grand challenges for engineering, and I am also part architect, part engineer, part human, uh, <laughs> from solar energy, carbon sequestration, cyberspace, nuclear terror. These are things that national societies are determining. This is our challenge. More closely to what I do, we're supposed to, in our industry, make new buildings, renovated buildings, on a scale down, not depend on fossil fuels by the year 2030. If we look at the harsh realities, we live in a world in which we have too many people. And they're sometimes concentrated in very big mega cities. We have too many cars. If you've ever driven in Atlanta or Houston or some other places, it's big parking lots during hours. We have too much stuff. OK, the squirrel kind of thing. It's all about stuff. So when we look at poverty, that hits us really close. And it's not somewhere else, but yeah, Sao Paulo, Brazil. And you look at port au prince Haiti, or you go to Nairobi, Kenya, or you go to Mumbai, India. But you know what? You don't need to go that far. Just go down to Texas. These are the colonias of Texas along the border with Mexico on our side of the fence. Part of what we do in the college is we have a colonias program, and we deal with increasing the quality of life of people in place from El Paso all the way to Brownsville. So I know what's there. So that is part of the reality. Look at the environmental impact. We mess up the air. We mess up the water. We mess up the land. We mess up people. These are real people. These are real children. These are real elders. They're all over the world. So one of the big unifiers of the world are the bad things we're doing. And those are the kinds of challenges that we have to face. We cannot look away. There are high levels of vulnerability. When the Earth decides to move, something bad happens. Not only on the Earth, but also with the tsunamis that get generated. When the air decides to move, call it hurricane, typhoon, tornado, cyclone, whatever it is, just high wind. We pay the price. When the water decides to not be good, you know, it causes floods and all these kind of things. And we also have the issue that fire is a reality. Bastrop was not that far away in our recent past. And we have disparities, dramatic disparities, from socioeconomic distribution, health and education, housing and natural and built environments, and environmental hazards and natural 
disaster. So here's the problem. These are very stark realities. And to do it even worse, <laughs> the report card for our America's infrastructure from the Association of Civil Engineers just came out with a D plus, which means that from aviation bridges, dams, and drinking water to energy hazardous west, inland waterways, levees, look at those grades. And this is in our country, from ports to rails to roads to solid waste to wastewater. So why am I starting with such a bleak picture? Because we have so much more. So whenever somebody says, I don't know what to do in class, I don't know what to create, I don't know what to research, I don't know what kind of problems to solve, all I have to say is open your eyes and look at what the world is facing, and this takes us to the second one. The second one basically says, how do we respond to this? Well, I can tell you that we cannot respond like we have been responding for so long with the same approaches. So what I'm going to share with you right now is that to address these global challenges, we need to actually develop local responses. And those local responses have to be concentrated in a single place, in a single region. They have to be localized. But how do we do that? We answer questions through research. We solve problems through expertise in multiple kinds of domains and fields. We satisfy needs through services. And we realize tremendous opportunities through entrepreneurship. And we fulfill aspirations because we're also in the business of dreams and fantasies and desires. How do we do that? Well, that's part of what we at a place like Texas A&M do as part of our academic mission. So if you put those things in the middle of what we're supposed to do as a tier one institution, as a land grant institution, we have learning and teaching, we have research, creative work and scholarship, and we have engagement. So when we frame this in this, we are totally poised through students, through faculty, through everyone to actually change the world in a positive way. But we need to begin with imagination. And that is something that I am a total passionate supporter and advocate. And imagination fueled by all those questions, all those problems, all those needs, they don't need to be bad. They just need to fuel the imagination. But how do you tame an unendless source of energy like this one? Well, you have to frame it somehow to capture the total energy. And for me, it's about creativity, innovation, design, and entrepreneurship. That is the core of what I teach in one of my classes. But it's also the core of the beginning of solutions to these problems. And imagination, if you look at it, you can enter it any way you want, from creativity, or you can enter it through design, or you can enter it through innovation. You can enter individually, or in pairs, or in trios, or in the whole thing. It is completely flexible, adaptable, and scalable. And if we intersect it in my world, that intersection happens because we are in the business of people, place, and what people do in a place. And our goal is to actually provide the highest quality of people for life, the highest quality of place where they do everything else. And when you frame that in that situation, we deal in three environments. Environment number one is the natural environment. That's what we inherit from the earth. That is the land, the sea, the skies. And by the way, we're a land grant institution, we're a sea grant institution, and we're a space grant institution here at Texas A&M. So when you put those three environments, it's a perfect stage to shine. And to shine by providing solutions, responding to those challenges. And in these three environments, what I would like to share very quickly are four paradigm shifts that I have accumulated over my life journey. First one, it's all about pluridisciplinarity. I always get messed up. So we take those questions, those problems, those needs and opportunities, and we tend to put them inside one discipline boundary, discipline depth, and solid theoretical foundation. That's not enough. So we need to also now do several other things. The first one is multidisciplinarity. We need to put some of those challenges in the middle of one discipline and invite other disciplines to come and help us out. But that's not enough. We need to put sometimes the problem in the middle and have a lot of disciplines come together. And the interaction between those disciplines leads to new fields, new discoveries, whole new worlds just because they're playing nicely with each other and learning from each other. But then that's not still enough. Sometimes there are common elements, and that's cross-disciplinarity, where the methods that you use 
like simulation and modeling, that applies to many things. But in doing one in economics or doing one in the physical geoscience world or doing one in whatever you want, everybody's learning from everybody else. And that leads us to the last one, which is transdisciplinarity, where you put it in the middle and you have one imperative to go within, between, across, and all disciplines. But the idea is an imperative of unity of knowledge, where you eventually start erasing all those artificial boundaries between fields and you focus on actually getting something done. But the second paradigm is integration. And we see sometimes this kind of tussle between those that teach and those that research and those that do service. Hey, you know, we're all in that business. Some do more than others. So for me, the whole paradigm needs to be a two-way street between <coughs> learning and teaching, research, creative work, and engagement. So we teach what's being practiced. We research what's being practiced. We teach what's being researched and research what's being taught and then take it back. That's a fantastic environment in which to operate. And when you look at that, you transcend traditional university education and you go out to K through 12. <coughs> you engage vocational and community schools. You do service learning. You do continuing education. And by doing that, what you're really doing is the whole pre-K through gray stage of learning. And that's the only way that you're going to develop local responses. We need that paradigm of discovery and knowledge creation. Why? Because we need to go from what is, in terms of the baseline of the status quo, those questions, problems, needs, opportunities, and aspirations, to what can be, and imagination fuels us in that level, to those answers, to those solutions, to that satisfaction, to that realization, and to that fulfillment. And how do you do that? A simple process called RD4E. RD4E stands with a continuum that never ends between research that leads to development, development that leads to demonstration, demonstration that leads to deployment, deployment that leads back to research, because you're constantly sandwiched in dissemination and sharing it with the world, and at the same time evaluating everything that you do. And the last paradigm is the one of expanded scholarship, because in that paradigm, any institution, academic or corporate or government, they have a space where they can actually interact and collaborate with each other. They have multiple opportunities to engage with multiple constituencies. The fundamental formula is that you have talent, you provide them with infrastructure, and then you unleash their capacity to respond, to create impact, and to transform. And what is really good is that if you transcend a certain view of scholarship, yes, you will always retain disciplinary depth, but the real fun is in discovery in each discipline, but even more discovery within multiple disciplines. And then you have to integrate, and then you have to apply, and then you have to teach, and then you have to engage. And by doing that and adding the world stage through strategic alliances and partnerships, then you start making a difference. Our college has presence in every single one of those continents, even Antarctica, with some of our students doing work in energy and some of those stations, but that is the reality. So how do you close this? It all goes down to the local lo responses require individual solutions. So what I'm gonna leave you is with just a very quick glimpse that you can achieve this by creating a very unique type of DNA. A DNA of imagination, creativity, innovation, design, and entrepreneurship within a total environment of transdisciplinarity. So, Bear with me. If you create that, you have a portal that provides access and a bridge that provides connection to all kinds of resources in every single one of these three environments. So it begins with the core. You've already seen this. Questions, problems, needs, opportunities, and aspirations. Put that core in the middle of what we're supposed to be doing at a place like us. And transcending Texas A&M, any place can benefit from that trio of learning, teaching, research, creative work, and scholarship, and the whole idea of engagement, practice, outreach, and service. So then, you embed this into another continuum. The continuum of imagination, creativity, innovation, design, and entrepreneurship. Change that floating pyramid into a circle that keeps on going. So what do you do now? You can align one orange with one red, yellow, or green in any of the areas that you want. Dial your desire to make a difference. And then you embed that into the whole idea 
of a continuum of discovery and knowledge generation, from benchmarks and baselines to visions and desired outcomes to research development, demonstration, deployment, dissemination, and evaluation. And now you have another set of permutations in terms of any blue with any orange with any color on any of the things that we want to tackle. But it doesn't stop there. When you put this together, you put it in the middle of dealing with real people. So if you use our college as an example, we have about 12 socio-technical groups that we have to deal with, from building science investigators to social science, land and real estate, architects, planners, engineers, contractors, financial institutions, you name it. Tell me that's not a rich stage to develop local solutions. So you take a pink, you take a blue, you take an orange, and then you align it with anything you want. So what happens when you put this this way? Well, you create over time something kind of interesting. You create a dynamic continuum of transdisciplinary interactions. And you take any of the connection points on any of those continuums, and what you have is a continuously evolving and adapting DNA that maintains the response at the individual solution level, locally centered, but addressing global challenges. Why? Because we're in the business of five things. Sustainable products, sustainable processes, sustainable services, sustainable unique experiences, and sustainable business models. But we also have to add the sixth one, which is remove all the barriers, remove all the obstacles, and remove all the inhibitors that prevent us from doing that. That's another source of imagination. So when you put all this, basically, it's about providing higher quality of life for people, whether they're individuals, families, organizations, or communities, society at large. It's about providing a higher quality of place for people, natural, built, virtual. And it's about providing a higher quality of living, of working, of learning, of healing, playing, praying, buying, interacting, any other activity that people need to do in a place. So when you put all that together, in closing, all I need to say is that we need to address global challenges, local responses, and individual solutions. And it all begins with one simple thing just imagining the possibilities. And with that, I say thank you.